invitation to present a lecture in this series of talks about voice disorders is indeed a real honor. I hope we, my colleagues and I, will be able to provide a little information <clears throat> that will be of use to you. First, I'd like to pull together a few threads of common information so that we'll have a, a universal starting point. Our ultimate objective, of course, is to find information which will be of assistance to persons who have voice problems. But our more immediate objective is to provide some uh, information for you that you'll be able to use when you work directly with a person who has a voice problem. Now, many of the voice disorders which you will encounter are in children and in teenagers. These, of course, will be a real challenge to the speech pathologists in the school systems. There are also many problems among adults, particularly those who use their voices in their livelihood, such as the actors, the singers, the ministers, and uh, many others. Now, <clears throat> voice deviations are uh, so common and so important that another factor we need to think about is that a number of them reflect or indicate some sort of disease and you and I need to be alert to that particular possibility. But regardless of these various factors, if you are a, a speech pathologist, a teacher of singing, an otolaryngologist, you can be sure that there will be individuals confronting you who have voice disorders. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we're presuming that uh, you're a rather sophisticated audience. That is, we presume that your definition of voice disorders is very much like ours. That is, that a voice disorder is a deviation from the type of voice that will be used by most of the persons of the same age, sex, and cultural background as the, the speakers. So this means, of course, that you have, we, we judge the voices, we classify them according to our basic experience, our training, but it is a matter of judgment. There is, we've mentioned uh, in these voice disorders that there are differences in pitch and in loudness and in quality. There are many fascinating bits of information about pitch disorders, pitches that are too high or too low, also about uh, loudness problems, voices that are too loud or not loud enough. But we'll be concentrating primarily today on the problems of quality and more specifically those problems of quality that are related to the way the vocal cords vibrate, that is the problems of phonation. <coughs> Now, with this focus in on the larynx and the laryngeal problems, it enables us for today at least to um, glorify the larynx. We can uh, say that the, the human body is composed of a larynx which supports the head and from which the rest of the body is suspended. Well, the uh, voice problems related to the larynx are commonly related or are referred to, as you know, as uh, hoarseness, breathiness, harshness, uh, aphonia, and the, the number of terms goes on for some time. But almost every one of us here will have experienced these, one of these disorders at least sometime in the lifetime along with a cold or laryngitis or um, the more popular term right now is an upper respiratory infection and obviously we've all had them. Now I believe we can serve you best in this particular talk by trying to explain how certain diseases and detrimental voice usage will impair the voice. Now impairing the voice is in our discussion comparable to impairing the function of the vocal cords. 
And as you become more familiar with the way in which disease and uh, uh, abusive behavior can influence the uh, vocal cord vibration, I think you'll gain a certain insight into the problems that we're concerned with today. Now, I've been talking a little bit about vocal cords. Just as a parenthetical expression, some of you may prefer vocal folds or vocal lips. <clears throat> use whatever terms you wish. They're all good terms. Just happens that habitually I tend to use vocal cord, but I don't mean that you should necessarily buy that. Now, our approach in this presentation of studying the laryngeal behavior means trying to bring some of the information from the laboratory into the clinical situation. This approach brings us to the realization that we, we practice an art. We've, uh, it's comparable to the art of medicine. We don't have any recipes for the treatment of voice disorders. We um, are required to select from among the various procedures which are available to us. Now, an artist mixes on his palette a number of colors, and uh, he selects from those colors according to his own experience and his training and his sense of uh, what is right. And you and I have need to use every bit of uh, scientific information, our background, our experience, our training, to mix together to provide the therapeutic procedures for this unique, distinct individual who is facing us and who has a voice problem. This type of presentation is thought of as a, a supplement to augment what you have in the textbooks. Uh, what we present here today, you can't put in a textbook. Voice is a very dynamic process. And in order to understand it adequately, I think we have to see it as a dynamic process. Consequently, wherever possible, we'll use uh, film to represent the motions of the vocal cords. Now, part of our little drawing together here of common information, I think we ought to review very quickly our concept of voice production. As we all know, the air comes from the lungs up the trachea to the larynx where the vocal cords are set into vibration by the uh, air stream itself. It's interesting to note that there are no two laryngees that are alike. They differ one from another just as faces differ one from another. And this uniqueness of the laryngeal structure uh, opens the way for a lot of speculation. In other words, is your voice your voice simply because you have a particular structure? No one knows the answer to it, and the speculation could lead us off far afield, so we won't have time to get into it today. But it's something that uh, sometime in the future we ought to talk about. Now, watching the larynx function is one way to gain some insight into what goes on down there. Now, there are several ways of uh, viewing the larynx. One is with a flexible fiber optic scope that is uh, threaded through the nose. It goes down behind the soft palate and then goes down as far as the larynx so that uh, you can look in and direct the scope so that uh, you can watch the vocal cords. And one of the great advantages of this type of scope is that the person is able to talk or sing and not be impaired by the, the instrument. Another way of viewing the larynx is with a rigid scope. Now the rigid scope goes through the mouth and it just happens to carry the uh, light back to the back of the mouth and into the pharynx. And it also has a lens system back there which enables you to uh, get a very good view of the laryngeal structures. And then there's the third way that we can mention here, and that's uh, the use of a mirror. This is the old way, and it's the way we have to do or use when we uh, make our films. Now, this mirror is placed back into the mouth, and uh, when it goes back all the way, 
you can uh, see the positioning of it with this slide that uh, we can look at on the uh, TV screen. Now, this view shows an adult male head and neck, uh, and it shows the handle of the mirror uh, extending through the mouth to the mirror proper, which is placed back in the pharynx. The rim of the mirror is touching the posterior pharyngeal wall uh, at the median sagittal plane. Now the soft palate is just above the mirror and its shadow may be seen through the ramus of the mandible. The bony hard palate extends anteriorly to the front teeth. Now both the upper and lower sets of teeth can be identified readily with the number of uh, fillings which are present. Obviously this uh, patient and his dentist were very good friends. Now if you look very carefully, you can see the faint shadow of the tongue slightly above the two lower posterior teeth. The curve of the tongue can be followed backward and downward where it becomes more evident as you look through the mandible. Now just below the tongue there's a dark area with a forward bulge. This area is the vallecula, a space between the tongue and the upper part of the epiglottis. You can see it extending above the image of the hyoid bone. Now when you trace the epiglottis downward, you come to that relatively bright region, which marks the general area of the thyroid cartilage, the arytenoid cartilages, and the vocal cords. Now you can see the cords bordering the lower side of the laryngeal ventricle, and the ventricle is that dark elliptical shadow shaped a little like a football. Then on below the larynx is the trachea, and behind it the area of the esophagus, which isn't very clear in this image. Now look at the image of the larynx as you'd be looking through the mouth and onto the mirror itself. If we see a slide of that again, here you see the circular rim of the mirror, and within that frame, the white vocal cords, which are abducted widely and form an inverted V. The top of the image is toward the front of the larynx, where you can see the upper border of the epiglottis. Then the pink structures lateral to both vocal folds are the ventricular or false vocal cords. At the bottom of the image, the vocal cords terminate at what we know to be the arytenoid cartilages, but their areas are partial, only partially visible in this uh, image. Now, if you look uh, between the vocal cords, the space that's called the glottis, you can see the inside of the front of the thyroid cartilage. At the very bottom of the image is a curved structure that is the front section of the cricoid cartilage. Incidentally, you're probably curious about the little round structure just below the posterior end of the subject's right vocal cord. And you remember a mirror view of the larynx presents the right vocal cord on your left uh, of the image. Now, laryngologists believe this little lump down there is a harmless little polyp. And as you probably know, polyps can grow not only in the larynx, but throughout the respiratory and digestive systems. Now, the same larynx, with a slightly different view, when the vocal cords are adducted or brought together for phonation. You can see the cords and the ventricular folds moved to their median positions. You can also see the regions of the arytenoid cartilage at the lower or posterior ends of the vocal cords. The cartilages are more prominent and the cords shorter than in the abducted image which you saw just previously. Now you probably noticed that the vocal cords appeared to change when uh, they were moved from the abducted position to the adducted position. Now, to compare the two images, we've tried a little trick of superimposing one on the other. Now, here, as you see those two, 
uh, you, the image may give you a little bit of difficulty at first. Uh, however, if you look carefully, you can identify the two laryngeal configurations by concentrating first on the adducted vocal cords in the middle of the combined image. You can see the line of the closed glottis. Now note the positions of the abducted or separated vocal cords. This combined image demonstrates that the cords are substantially shorter when they are positioned for phonation. The arytenoid cartilages occupy about one-third of the glottal length and they also fill a significant area in the supraglottal larynx. Now the static images that you have been uh, viewing here are helpful in identification of structures and so on, but uh, when you can see the motion of them, actually see them move, uh, you get another dimension which I believe is quite useful to you. Let's go back again, this time to a piece of film. A moment ago, when you saw this larynx on two slides, it was pretty still. But now observe what you or a laryngologist might see when you put a mirror into a mouth and look uh, at the larynx with that mirror. Motion adds much to our understanding of the dynamics of laryngeal function. This short section of film will be repeated several times to allow you to observe in some detail the adduction and abduction of the vocal cords. You can see a moment of phonation followed by abduction for inhalation, then adduction and the resumption of phonation. We've discovered great value in repeated viewing of uh, selected sections of film. It's impossible to see and evaluate the motions, the positions, the structures, and the colors in a single viewing. Consequently, throughout this presentation, we'll repeat selected scenes to give you the opportunity to examine the images in greater detail. Now when you watch that little section of film, you could tell when the vocal cords were vibrating by the fuzziness along their edges. However, you couldn't see the nature of those vibratory movements. They were occurring too fast for the unaided eye to follow. And uh, consequently, we go to ultra slow motion photography in order to show the vibratory characteristics. Now as we look at this section of black and white film, we see normal adult male vocal cords beginning to vibrate. You can see the cords adducting and starting to vibrate before the glottis closes. There are several vibratory cycles in which the vocal cords remain in contact with each other an unusually long time and the pattern is irregular. However, after a very brief period, the vibration becomes regular. You probably realize that vibration in this and other laryngeas varies considerably from time to time. These vocal cords were photographed approximately at 5,000 pictures per second. Now when such film is projected at the normal 24 pictures per second, the time factor is stretched so that what took one second to photograph is spread over 165 seconds or about two and three quarter minutes in projection. Now as you watch the repeating series of vibratory movements, you can see that the vocal cords move away from each other, then swing toward each other and meet to close the glottis. The glottal opening, closing and closed phases make up what is called the vibratory cycle. Each of the phases within the cycle can become longer or shorter, which causes various quality variations. Now let me explain the lines on the film image. On the left is an oscilloscope trace of an electroglottograph signal, which we do not have time to discuss here. On the right side are timing signals. The square wave has a frequency of 5,000 hertz, with which the vibration frequency of the vocal folds can be measured. The pitch of the sound, which is related to frequency, is determined by the number of times the glottis opens and closes in each second. 
Every time the glottis is pushed open by the airstream, a puff of air is released, which generates a pressure pulse in the air, and a series or a chain of these pulses creates a sound wave. Now, the vocal cords you've been watching appeared to be several inches long. Many of you probably have seen images of the cords that were maybe several feet long uh, when they were projected on a screen from a film. Well, as you will see presently, their size is quite critical. But really, just how large are they? Well now, we'd like to show you another slide. This time, uh, shows a somewhat asymmetrical uh, male larynx that produced normal vocal sound. You can also see this superimposed grid which permits measurement of structures and areas. Each square represents one-tenth of an inch on each side, even though the image you see on the video screen is uh, substantially larger and there's quite a magnification, obviously. Now, the grid needs a little explanation. The vertical lines appear in pairs. This pairing is the result of the reflection from both surfaces of a transparent mirror, which is simply a technical matter that need not concern us here. And the distance from one of the vertical lines to the comparable line in the adjacent pair is one-tenth of an inch. Then the distance between the horizontal lines, which are not paired, is also one-tenth of an inch. Now, if you measure the length of the vocal cords in this photograph by counting the horizontal lines, you can see that these cords are approximately six-tenths of an inch long. A little guessing is necessary since the anterior and posterior ends of the cords are obscured. Now, if we see this same larynx, with the vocal cords adducted, uh, we can see that um, they appear to be about one-tenth of an inch shorter than when abducted or separated. That is, the vibrating cords are about one-half inch, or if you prefer, about twelve and a half millimeters long. We tend to forget that the larynx is a very small sound generator. Now the real size of the laryngeal structures and their movements are really quite difficult to comprehend. If you have a dime handy, just take it out and hold it in your hand. Now, this particular uh, slide that's coming up will show you a chart which is drawn to scale on millimeter paper. And it shows that the diameter of the dime which you're holding in your hand there is about seven-tenths of an inch, or 18 millimeters. Now, as you probably recall, the vocal cords you just saw with the superimposed grid measured about one-tenth of an inch less than the diameter of a dime when they were abducted. and a tenth of an inch shorter than that when adducted for phonation. Now many adult female vocal cords have maximum lengths of one half inch, with less, of course, during phonation. Now just try to imagine how tiny an infant's larynx is, and think of the noise it can make when it cries. It's obvious that the amount of sound a larynx can produce is not related to the size of the vocal cords. Now, when vocal cords are abducted widely, the maximum distance between the arytenoids is three to four tenths of an inch, which means one and one half to two tenths of an inch, three to five millimeters, on either side of the median sagittal plane. Now, when the arytenoids are adducted and vibration occurs, the glottal width varies during vibration from a slit almost too small to measure to about four millimeters or one and one half tenths of an inch in a large larynx. 
This means that each vocal cord might move as much as two millimeters laterally, but usually the distance is much less. A dime is about one millimeter thick. Picture the movement of a vocal cord at about the thickness of one or two dimes. One further observation about size is important here. Since the glottis is elliptical, it tapers from its maximum widths to no opening at all at the anterior and posterior commissures. Now the purpose of these measurements is to emphasize the fact that the vocal cords are quite small, the vibratory movements are minute, and the glottal area is tiny. Now you're probably wondering why we're putting so much emphasis on the size of the larynx. To understand its significance, we need to turn our attention briefly to the structural changes that can occur in the laryngeal uh, structures along with disease and uh, vocal abuse. When a person yells himself hoarse at a football game, Uh, you wonder what has happened. Yelling and screaming are accompanied by vigorous vibration of the vocal cords. And this activity causes edema within the covering membranes on the vocal cords and also some dilation of the blood vessels. Now edema and uh, dilation cause swelling. Now, when you recall the small size of the vocal cords and their limited movements, you can realize that swelling of as little as half a millimeter on each cord, which your eye could scarcely see, could reduce the glottal width by a half or more. Furthermore, at the attachments at the anterior commissure, the swollen areas can press the cords together firmly so that they limit the movement and they reduce the actual length of the glottis. Now these changes alter the vibrating pattern and consequently, of course, the quality of the voice. Now realize too that the swelling is not uniform usually. Irregularities can complicate the, the vibratory pattern even further. Now when swelling continues to increase, the vocal cords lose their flexibility and may become too bulky and stiff to vibrate. Consequently, uh, you have uh, aphonia. Now, abusive voice production, whether acutely traumatic or extending over a long period of time, can cause changes in vocal cord tissues. In order to demonstrate this, we'd like to show you a little bit of color motion picture. Uh, sometimes um, a blood vessel will uh, rupture and cause some blood to flow into uh, a protrusion on the cord, which you see in this uh, image. Uh, sometimes they form a little blood blister there. They frequently, these little hemorrhages, frequently result from vocal abuse. Now the redness from the enclosed blood which was present originally in this film has almost disappeared when these photographs were made. But the edema remained to cause the lesion to persist, as you can see. Now the residual blood measured, uh, uh, the, the original polyp here measured a couple of millimeters along its base and it's about uh, one millimeter high. The little one-tenth inch grid which you see in the corner of this and other films is used to measure these images. Now the voice produced by this female larynx was low-pitched and slightly hoarse. Phonation was particularly difficult in the upper part of her range. Now this woman, who was in her 50s, talked much, sang, and directed a choir. 
Now we can continue watching this larynx with a little high speed film. Unfortunately, this slow motion film shows only part of the lesion and the posterior two thirds of the vocal cords. However, it reveals a vibratory pattern in which there are two abnormalities that are probably responsible for the vocal deviations. You probably have already noticed that there's no complete glottal closure during vibration. This condition is associated with breathiness. Second, you occasionally you will see the vibration uh, pattern change suddenly and become irregular. This type of motion creates the randomly irregular vibrations that accompany rough hoarseness. Now the electroglottograph trace on the left has a wide amplitude and sometimes gets in the way of the laryngeal image. The EGG signals uh, show certain features of vocal cord contact and glottal opening. Those of you who may be familiar with the electroglottograph should know that at any given instant in these films, the oscilloscope trace is displaced approximately five film frames behind the corresponding laryngeal image. The relationship results from the arrangement of lenses in the high-speed camera. Now, you're all <coughs> familiar, of course, with the term vocal nodules. They often accompany this yelling and screaming and the prolonged misuse of the voice, which we've been talking about. I'd like you to see some uh, film, a film of some vocal nodules. Now this photograph shows the larynx of a high school football coach who used his voice vigorously and often. With the vocal cords abducted, you can see the shape and size of typical large bilateral vocal nodules. The grid reveals the nodules on his left vocal cord, the one on your right, to be about two tenths of an inch, about five millimeters long, and the one on the right cord to be a little longer. The epiglottis obscures approximately the anterior one tenth of an inch, that is two and a half millimeters, of both vocal cords. These vocal cords are estimated to be about six tenths of an inch or 15 millimeters long. This means that the nodules occupy about one third of the total length of the cords. The nodules measure about uh, two millimeters high in their uncompressed state. I should like to observe that the size of a hand does not determine the size of a blister that might form on it. Similarly, the size of lesions that develop, the, the, the size of the vocal cords does not determine the size of vocal nodules or other lesions that might develop on them. However, lesions of a given type, size, and location in a small larynx can be expected to create greater vocal problems than a comparable lesion in a large larynx. Now, if we look at this same subject, when these vocal cords are adducted for phonation, the nodules appear to be pressed together firmly and to hold the glottis open. However, this static image and uh, the image you see in textbooks presents only part of the total behavior of nodules. You'll observe subsequently in some motion picture film that nodules move in relation to their underlying structures. The glottal area posterior to the nodules is about two and a half tenths of an inch, that is six millimeters long, only a little longer than the nodules at their bases and about one third the diameter of a dime. The anterior segment of the glottis is not visible. Now it happens that vocal nodules are much more common among uh, young women than men. And this relationship is reversed in children. There are more boys who have nodules, prepubertal boys, than the girls. Now here you see in this uh, motion picture film large bilateral asymmetrical vocal nodules 
in a 22-year-old college student. She was busy in campus extracurricular activities. She had many friends and was excessively verbal. Even though you can't see the entire length of the vocal cords at one time, you can recognize by combining the several images that the vocal nodules are located approximately at the junction of the anterior and middle thirds of the cords. This position is also in the middle of the membranous parts of the cords, or the vocal lips if you prefer. The white mass that occasionally intrudes into the bottom of the image is the tongue. Now, <clears throat> as you watch the vibration, you can see that the nodules compress each other during contact. When the vocal cords swing laterally, the nodules are pulled apart and lag behind the vocal cords proper. Then when the vocal cords reach their maximum lateral positions, the nodules have shifted to the superior surfaces of the cords and don't protrude into the glottis. This observation indicates that the nodules are confined primarily to the surface membranes. The changes of position also suggest a basis for different degrees of vocal variation in relation to phonation at different pitches and loudness levels. That is, raising and lowering vocal pitch is associated with elongation and shortening of the vocal cords. These adjustments change the tension of the surface membranes and also alter the firmness and elasticity of the underlying muscles. Different amounts of swelling can also alter the behavior of the membranes and the nodules. In other words, the positions, the motions, and influences of nodules can vary from time to time, even in the same individual. Furthermore, since no two larynges are alike, one can reason that the influences of the several variations will probably affect the vocal sound uniquely in each larynx. Now, vocal nodules are among the most common problems encountered by speech pathologists. We know the lesions are associated with vocal abuse, and there is extensive evidence that they will recede when vocal abuse is eliminated. Furthermore, they don't return if non-abusive voice production is learned. The next film that we'll show here presents the larynx of a speech pathology major, a student in her early 20s who overused her voice in high school. She was a cheerleader and she was vocal abusive in many other ways. When she entered the speech pathology training program, her voice had the typical breathy hoarseness and limited pitch range that often accompany vocal nodules. When she started voice therapy, her nodules were similar to those you just saw. And after a period of therapy, they, it, it produced considerable improvement in her voice. And although the nodules were still present, uh, the view was as you'll see in this next bit of film. The nodules are smaller than those just previously shown which was expected since the voice has, had improved. However, some vocal problem persisted which correlated with the visible image. The subject is attempting to produce a series of E-type vowels with inhalation between each phonation. <clears throat> the mass that occasionally obscures the posterior commissure is the uvula, which slides down from behind the laryngeal mirror during inhalation and is reflected in the mirror. The size and position of the nodules becomes evident momentarily during several of the phonations. Now if we go into this slow motion film, we see that the nodules still interfere with glottal closure, but vocal cord contact is almost complete in each cycle. The close approximation undoubtedly contributes to the improved vocal quality. 
Note the mucus that strings out from the nodules and breaks as they separate. You've probably noticed also that the nodules roll onto the superior surfaces of the cords at the lateral extremes of their excursions, as in the previous larynx. Now look carefully at the lower or deeper borders of the vocal cords as they swing toward each other. You can see the broad nodular masses approaching and meeting during the closing phase of the cycles. Immediately after they meet, the mucosa on the superior surfaces slides medially and obscures the underlying parts. Now, the hematoma and vocal nodules you have seen were related to loud and often high-pitched vocal abuse. Another problem related to um, a different kind of vocal abuse is called contact ulcer. This name was given by Dr. Chevalier Jackson, one of the pioneers about the turn of the century in the field of otolaryngology. He observed that the ulcer sometimes occurs on one or both vocal processes of the arytenoids when they smash together frequently and vigorously during adduction. These ulcers are customarily associated with low-pitched, vigorous, frequent phonation over a period of time. However, there's evidence that an ulcer can be developed in a very brief few minutes uh, through a series of staccato phonations. Now, the types of vocal abuse associated with contact ulcer seem to be much more common than the ulcers. This apparent low correlation suggests the presence of some additional factor that cooperates in the formation of the ulcers themselves. And several investigators uh, reported the special factor, they believe anyway, to be stomach reflux, resulting from a hiatal hernia and uh, or certain other digestive problems. Now the ref reflux is presumed to irritate the mucosa on the arytenoid cartilages, making those areas more susceptible to the vocal abuse. Now, contact ulcers don't influence the voice until the inflammatory process creates edema and dilation of the blood vessels uh, that extend onto the vocal cords. Now, since the lesion is posterior, the effect on the vocal cords occurs gradually with the extension of the swelling. However, this first evidence of uh, an ulcer is a sharp pain either in the larynx or sometimes it's referred to the ear. I'd like to show you some uh, film uh, with contact ulcer. This film shows a yellowish slightly pink mass on the medial surface of the right arytenoid cartilage toward the base of the vocal process. The mass is granulation tissue which marks the area of the contact ulcer. Erythema, that is the redness, resulting from the dilation of the small blood vessels, can be seen extending anteriorly and laterally onto the vocal cord. The person presenting this contact ulcer didn't have any pain or other discomfort resulting from the lesion. The voice was altered minimally, about as it would have been in the early stages of a cold that involved the larynx. The granulation tissue was first observed during a routine demonstration mirror examination of the larynx. The lesion reduced progressively in size and disappeared completely in about five months. Sometimes hoarseness is present uh, when the larynx appears to be completely normal when viewed in the mirror. The voice simply tells us that the vocal cords aren't vibrating properly, but uh, there's no visible evidence 
of that uh, deviation. Now research has demonstrated that hoarseness is associated with random variability in the length of the consecutive vibratory cycles. Obviously, an ordinary mirror view can't show that. Now, a teacher came to us not long ago with a very hoarse voice. <clears throat> the reports that she brought indicated that she had what appeared to be an essentially normal larynx, which implied a functional problem. She was about 30 years old and was teaching an elementary school grade when we saw her. When she was in college and she was a cheerleader, she had surgery to remove nodules and subsequently taught physical education for some long time. Now, as you can see from her film, with that vocal history, you could logically expect to find a recurrence of nodules or some other visible pathology. However, as you can see, the structures and color appear essentially normal. Yet, if you look carefully, as the section of film is repeated, you can see a slight indentation on the left vocal cord anteriorly and on the opposite side, just anterior to the vocal process of the arytenoid. There, there, there's a small protrusion from the glottal border. Now, this ultra-slow motion scene reveals that her right vocal cord has a wider excursion than the left, and both its lateral and medial movements precede those of the left. This leading movement causes the two cords to be out of phase, and as you can see, there's no complete glottal closure. The indentation on the left cord seems to contribute to the absence of a closed phase. Note also that there appears to be a slightly enlarged area on the posterior segment of the left cord, which seems to be less flexible than the opposite cord. This stiff area also moves somewhat out of phase with the motion of the anterior segment of that same cord. The combination of motions of the left cord probably create the vibratory irregularities that cause the hoarseness. I'd like to stress here that visually insignificant structural changes can create deviant vibratory patterns which cause serious hoarseness. Just report, just because a report says the larynx appears normal and hoarseness is present doesn't necessarily mean it is normal. The statement simply means that the cause of the hoarseness isn't evident, whereupon the assumption is made that the cause is functional. Now, in some ways, the next patient is similar to the one you just saw. That is, she had surgery for the removal of nodules when she was about 20 years old and in college. One vocal cord sustained the loss of some tissue along the glottal border, which produced a small anterior glottal opening during phonation, which you will see. <clears throat> she also has what appears to be a stiffened area just anterior to the one of the arytenoid cartilages. However, without careful observation, these features could be missed and the larynx judged to be normal. Her voice is relatively normal on very high sung tones, but becomes progressively more diplophonic as the pitch is lowered. Her speaking voice is diplophonic most of the time. This woman is in her early 50s. She's lived happily with her voice throughout her adult life without concern because she was assured earlier that there wasn't any disease present and that her larynx was essentially normal. She is a piano teacher in a college and uh, came to our clinic because a friend simply said maybe there's something that could be done to help her voice. Well now, as you watch her film, note the anterior part of the glottal opening during phonation and the slightly puffy appearance of the left vocal cord. You can also see a sudden shift of the anterior larynx to one side. This movement occurred when the subject dropped her vocal pitch about an octave and then let it glide back up. 
that type of lateral movement sometimes accompanies unilateral paralysis of the cricothyroid muscle, but we could observe no other evidence of any paralysis. <clears throat> now, note how the enlarged area of the left vocal cord flops into the glottis and strikes the opposite cord. As the pitch rises, the vibratory movements become out of phase and momentarily disintegrate into random oscillation. With continuing rise in pitch, the posterior parts of the vocal cords are pressed together progressively toward the front, thereby shortening both the glottal opening and the vibrating segments of the vocal cords. This type of adjustment is commonly used to achieve high pitches. The motions you saw generated a prominent diplophonia throughout the shift from the lower to the higher pitches. Now, the illustrations used so far have focused on familiar vocal disorders. And they're relatively directly or indirectly related to vocal abuse. I believe there's another very common problem that deserves our attention, although usually it's not caused by vocal abuse. I refer to laryngitis caused by a disease organism, a condition to which we're all subject from time to time. <clears throat> when singers, actors, ministers, teachers, and others who use their voices in their work are afflicted, they're properly concerned and frequently ask their doctors for medical relief plus advice about using their voices during the course of the disease. Most medications are palliative and the usual advice is to use the voice as little as possible. Fortunately, most people don't feel like singing or talking when they have a laryngitis, which is fortunate because they automatically rest their voices. Laryngitis is usually temporary, but during the course of the disease, is vocal use potentially detrimental to the voice and the larynx? I believe it is, and I'd like to offer a little support for this opinion in this next uh, bit of film. First, <clears throat> notice the generalized erythema with prominent dilated blood vessels on the vocal cords and throughout the larynx. Then <clears throat> note the light-colored area on the anterior section of this man's right cord. This region reveals congestion in the submucosal area that is similar to that in the nose during a cold. As the scene is repeated, you can see that the swelling in the light area extends posterior, posteriorly on the upper surface of the right vocal cord. The left cord appears to be less swollen than the right. This film demonstrates that the common disorder called laryngitis may be and often is a real disease. When you have laryngitis, your voice usually is hoarse. What's the relationship between the disease and the voice? Again, the high-speed film reveals what the unaided eye can't see. <clears throat> Undoubtedly, you're attracted immediately to the strange atypical motions of the left cord. Its anterior and posterior segments often move in opposite directions. The posterior segment bumps the opposite cord more or less regularly. And after three or four of these movements, the entire glottis closes momentarily as a result of the medial swing of the anterior segment of the left cord combined with a slight medial motion of the relatively stiff right cord. While there's a randomness in the vibration, there's repetition of the complex motion. The left cord seems to be quite flaccid and somewhat edematous on its underside. There's not time to show you additional films of this subject that were made during the course of the disease and when he was phonating at various pitch levels. However, I can report 
that the right vocal cord remained relatively stiff and maintained a smaller amplitude during all phonatory tasks. The left cord was more active consistently, but its vibratory patterns varied with the general pitch level. There was less randomness in the lowest and the highest parts of the range. The section of film used here represents the vibration at a middle pitch. Laryngitis probably affects each larynx uniquely. Consequently, the abnormalities shown here can't be generalized. However, there is evidence that laryngitis can temporarily alter both the structure of the vocal cords and the vibratory patterns. I believe the structures in a larynx with laryngitis are sick enough to need rest to assist in recovery. The muscles and membranes are probably affected enough to sustain some permanent damage if used much while the infection is present. Consequently, if we come back to the earlier question about the relationship between laryngitis and voice, we can support the advice to use the voice minimally during an acute laryngitis. Now, we've attempted to stress two concepts about the larynx and vocal cord behavior that we believe are basic guides in diagnosis and therapy for voice disorders. First, the larynx is a very small sound generator in which minute changes can have very large effects on the voice. And second, these small changes can come from vocal abuse, disease, or loss of tissue, which express their effects through generalized enlargement, localized swelling, or circumscribed deficits. Any of these alterations can modify vocal cord vibration or glottal closure and can cause abnormal voice. Now from this kind of background, it's not difficult to realize that any condition that can alter the function or physical condition of the larynx can affect the voice. Some of those conditions potentially include fatigue, anemia, allergens, edema, glandular imbalance, respiratory infections, pollutants, noxious substances, laryngeal tumors of all types, anxieties when with both their associated systemic disturbances and laryngeal hyperfunction, subtle neural impairments, and even congenital asymmetries in laryngeal structures. Now, the sequel to that concept is that voice therapy must encompass three roots. One, attention to the health of both the person and the larynx. Second, consideration of the communication, emotional, and health factors in the individual's work, recreation, and living environments. And third, modification of the detrimental manner of voice production. Now our time has run out. It's been a privilege to talk to you about a few basic concepts related to voice. We hope you'll accept the tremendous challenge of working with voice disorders.